Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. Really great conversation on today's episode with Parker Stevenson of Evolved Finance. Parker is a co-owner and the chief business officer at Evolved Finance, a bookkeeping firm that specializes in helping online entrepreneurs to build more profitable and financially stable online businesses. For over six years, Parker has been advising some of the top coaches, course creators, influencers, and thought leaders on how to make more sound business decisions using their financial data. For a lot of health entrepreneurs, or really entrepreneurs in just about any category, the topic of managing money and tending to finances is one of those head in the sand things that we'd just rather not spend mental energy on and hope it all works itself out come tax time. Or maybe that's just me. Parker patiently answered all of our bookkeeping and basic business finance questions and left us feeling optimistic and confident that this business essential is easy to master and that you can have a nice relationship with your books. We'd love to have you screenshot your podcast player and tag us on Instagram at Health Coach Radio. Don't forget the show notes for this episode and all previous episodes of Health Coach Radio can be found at primalhealthcoach.com slash radio. So maybe you're not quite at the level of needing bookkeeping help just yet, but if you want to be, the best, most foolproof way to grow your practice, get more clients, earn more money, and change more lives is to be a really masterful coach. This is exactly what I teach our students in the Primal Health Coach Level 2 Certification course. Not only will you learn and practice advanced coaching skills, but this course also satisfies the educational requirements to enable you to sit for the NBC HWC credentialing exam so you can become a board-certified health and wellness coach. Stay tuned to the end of the show where Laura will explain a little bit more about what we teach, how, and why. In the meantime, head to primalhealthcoach.com slash level 2 to get more info. Let's dive into this conversation. We know you're going to love it. So please welcome Parker Stevenson. All right, Parker Stevenson, thank you so much for joining us today. I am super excited about this because I come from this background and Erin is super excited about this because she doesn't come from this background. So regardless of whether you listening here, you health coaches have a background in oh, the F word, finance or not. This is going to be a really interesting conversation today. So Parker Stevenson, if you don't mind, we would love for you to share a little bit about who you are, what you do, and why our health coaches should be listening. Absolutely. Well, thank you, ladies, for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. Um, so my name is Parker Stevenson. I'm a co-owner and the chief business officer for a bookkeeping firm called Evolve Finance. And I think the reason why I'm on the show is because we specialize in serving a lot of coaches and course creators, really online business owners selling either digital products or services online. So we have a lot of experience working with various types of coaching businesses, seeing behind the scenes with their numbers and how their businesses operate, how much money are they bringing, they're bringing in, what they spend their money on, how they keep their businesses profitable. So I'm very excited to jump in this conversation with you two. And just as a heads up, like I, I'm someone that um, looked at myself as a creative. I was a musician for a number of years. I didn't really see myself getting into numbers and, and wanting to understand this side of business. But what I found personally was I loved business. I loved creating things and part of the creation process of building a business revolves around understanding the financial functions of your business. And, and what I want to just emphasize here is that the, the finance part really isn't that complicated for small businesses. The concepts are really simple. It's the details of like, how do you do the bookkeeping and how do my taxes work? All these pieces that that's what we pay experts for. And you don't need to be an expert in that part of your business, but understanding the basic financial principles, uh, the basic financial guidelines to running a healthy business. I really believe anybody with whatever background can learn how to do this stuff. Hmm. Well, you got my attention and I like how you reframed it for me as, as sort of a creative pursuit. Like there can be, it can be a creative endeavor to get excited about how your money works or it can, it can be fun or something because I shut down. I shut down when I have to talk about it. Um, 
So let's start with that. <laughs> let's start with the, the client who shuts down when the topic of organizing money comes up. Like, wh what do you think that's all about? Well, I, I think in, in, especially in America, money is such a taboo subject to begin with. Yeah. I think most American families, your parents don't talk to you about their financial situation. They probably aren't giving you a whole lot of advice about how money works or your relationship with money. And maybe you even saw your own parents kind of have crappy relationships with money and you saw it as a source of stress or, or conflict. And, and there was actually a study done in, uh, I think it was in England where they did this survey and asked people, would they rather talk about money or their sex lives? And people would rather talk about their sex lives than they talk about money, right? And, uh, and I thought that was just so interesting because it just, what's more intimate than, than your sex life? And most people think money is more intimate than that. And, and it's, it's interesting, especially now that all I do is talk about money, look behind the scenes and look at money. I'm like, what's the big deal here? Like, this doesn't seem like it should be um, that triggering, but it, it makes sense. I, I don't think American culture um, likes to talk about money. And then when you go to the business side of it, like when I was in college and I was in business school, I was a marketing major, but I had to take these finance classes. And I remember going, I have no context for what you're talking about for accounting for a massive corporation. Um, I don't understand like the context around finance in a major corporation. And that's what they're really prepping you to do is like, all right, here's the financial principles you need for a giant business that you've never been a part of because you're 20 years old and maybe you've had an internship at best. And here's a bunch of concepts that aren't going to make sense to you. And, and, and maybe it just didn't click for me. I'm sure, you know, there's plenty of people around me who got A's in their finance and accounting classes. But I know for me personally, as a creative, I was like, how does this all connect together? And when the hell would any of this stuff matter? And the reality is for small business owners, it's not that complicated. It's not that sophisticated. And that's where I think when you're trying to get in the weeds of doing your own bookkeeping and try to track all this by yourself, sure, everyone might have to kind of do this in the beginning stages of their business because there's just so few transactions. It's so simple. There's not a lot to do. But once you start to know as your business grows, who do I hire and who do I, I bring in to advise me around this stuff? That's where, again, what they do might have a little bit of complexity to it, but your understanding of it as a business owner really is no more complex. You guys are probably as health professionals and nutrition professionals, there's concepts you have to understand that would go so far over my head and are mm -hmm. so much more complicated than the financial side of your businesses. Can we stop for one second? And can you define bookkeeping? Yeah. So that's a, it's, it's, it's a simple question. And it's one that I think most entrepreneurs need to hear the answer to. Cause again, I don't think it's talked about what is it really? Um, and I think a lot of uh, small business owners get confused about, well, what should my accountant be doing versus my bookkeeper? Bookkeeping yeah. is the organizing of the financial data in your business. It's, it's someone looking at all these transactions happening in your checking account, happening in the credit card, happening in your merchant accounts, and making sure this data is put into bookkeeping software, which we use QuickBooks online. It's a very popular uh, software program for, for bookkeepers. And we're just trying to start to organize these transactions in two categories. So if you look at your bank statement and just look at all the transactions, it doesn't tell you anything. All you know mm -hmm. is, I guess I have money in the bank, but there's all this long list of transactions. There's no way to interpret that or, or analyze that in a way that's going to help you understand your business better. A bookkeeper is going to take all those transactions and go, okay, here's all the advertising um, expenses we had. Here's all of the software expenses that we had. Here's all the team expenses that we had and grouping them into these categories. So now as a business owner, you can go, cool. I made this much income this month. I spent this much money on these types of expenses. Again, marketing, labor, contractors, travel, software. And then here's how much money I have left over. Mm -hmm. So we really look at ourselves as a bookkeeping firm, as, as financial data experts, we want to organize this data in a way that for you as the book or the business owner, you can understand, Oh, cool. This is where my money is going. Yeah. And then also your accountant can look at this data and go, cool. I can file your taxes super easily. And that's the role we want your accountant to have. Your accountant should be the person that's then like, okay, I get paid to be an expert on taxes. Give me your numbers so I can file your taxes um, accurately and on time. 
and make sure we're doing everything we can to save you on taxes. So bookkeepers, more of a data expert, mm -hmm. your financial data expert, your accountant is going to be more your tax expert and your tax advisor. I love it. You know, the, you know, to, to Aaron's question, but also your answer around, you know, here in the U S it's just, this is a topic people are uncomfortable around. And I, I think a lot of this is because no one's ever taught any of this stuff. They do not teach basic financial concepts in school here. No one learns what a checking account is, what a savings account is, what interest is. Nobody learns how to balance a checkbook. That's not a class in school. I, rem I literally remember going to college, <laughs> opening my first checking account. My degree was in elementary education and I ended up in <laughs> finance, but, you know, but I opened a checking account and um, I bounced a check one day. I'm like, what do you mean? That checks. <laughs> like I just, I just, no one taught me how to actually balance a checkbook and that, you know, that debit card is not a credit card. Like no, no one teaches you, first of all, what credit is, how dangerous it can be, wh where, how to appropriately use credit, right? And lending, no one really understands debits and credits and how all this works. It's super duper confusing. And I just think it's an area of insecurity for so many people. Because, because I think it feels like you're an adult, you should know how to do this. And you're like, cool, I'm an adult, but there's also a lot of things no one teaches you and you're just expected to go figure out on your own. And again, finance, I think is such a broad topic mm -hmm. that while the information might be out there waiting for you, it's hard to know, well, what's relevant for me? What is good advice? And so that's why I just, when, when people, you know, like you're saying to Aaron, where you kind of feel like you shut down around money, I go, you're not alone. Like it's all good. There's no shame in that. But I also want to encourage people to understand that it's totally possible to move past that. And if anything, again, me as this creative artist with like long hair and wearing my dicky shorts and playing <laughs> rock shows in my twenties is now like, hell yeah, let's jump into the numbers. That's where like the business, like your business can change your life. If we yeah. understand how the money moves through our business, we can make decisions that's going to make our businesses profitable. So while you're like changing your clients' lives and making an impact on the world and sharing your ex expertise, you're also putting money in your pocket along the way, which is kind of the main point. I think we all want to pay our bills and be able to right. retire and do these things. But if we ignore the financial sides of our businesses, um, there's no guarantee you're going to end up in a better financial situation because of it. We do have this extra responsibility as business owners to have to start to manage this. Because if you don't want to manage it, go get a job and someone mm -hmm. will cut you a paycheck every week or every month. And it's really simple. If we want to be business owners, we can't put our heads in the sand around the things we don't like. But again, small businesses are so much easier to run. Uh, there's so many more resources out there that again, we see people, our clients all the time come to us with no business backgrounds at all. And then really can blow their businesses up to, we see them multi seven figures all the way into the eight figure range. And they were just people who just figure it out as they go along. So if mm -hmm. you're letting your, like some of these hangups stop you from taking action and learning, I just encourage you, we see people all the time moving past this stuff and, and really owning every aspect of their businesses. It just goes to confidence, right? So I, I think if you can understand where you are financially, it makes it much easier for you to have confidence to even pursue a change like this, to even go to business. Then you get up and running and you realize at some point you're like a band of one. And at some point you've got to look for resources, but until you really understand where you are financially, you don't have the security and the confidence to invest in other, you know, how do you know something's a good investment for you? I, I deal with this all the time as the admissions director, someone that's taken like umpteen different courses and they still haven't launched. So they're going to take another darn course and spend more money. I mean, great. We'd love to have you great, but let's make sure that you're, you know, I think getting a return on that investment, right? Exactly. And, and so Every single step of the way, your ability to grow and be successful is going to be directly correlated to your own confidence and your ability to take action. And if you don't know where your starting place is, if you can afford things, if it's a, you're going to lack that confidence and you're more than likely not going to take the step and do the action, which then leads to a lack of success or less uh, success. I totally agree. What I think most entrepreneurs don't realize 
is how important clarity is mm -hmm. and how important feedback is. And you don't get feedback if you're not taking action and trying things and doing things because no one starts their business and does it perfectly from the start. There's trial and error um, and there's an evolution that happens as you get better at what you do and you learn the game of entrepreneurship. But we also need clarity and we need feedback around, okay, I'm taking action. What is the data telling me? What are the numbers telling me? What am I, what, what is it showing me about the, the action I'm taking that's working or not working? And so the, the analogy I like to uh, make is if I gave you a car and I completely removed the dashboard, so you can't see the speedometer, the gas tank, nothing, but all you know is you turn the key on or you turn, put the key in and turn it, it turns on. Mm -hmm. So you can drive the car. It's going to be stressful as hell. I don't want a car with no dashboard for me and my personality. I would probably be going to the gas station every two days. Cause I'd be terrified of running out of gas on the freeway. I'd be going <laughs> to the mechanic way more often than I should, because I'd be terrified that the check engine light is on and I can't see it. But then there's going to be someone with the opposite personality type of me. Who's going to run that thing into the ground. They're going to be paying so much money to get their car towed around. They're going to be running out of gas and either situation sucks. It's stressful. Yeah. And that's what the numbers in your business tell you. I mean, there's the, the marketing data. If you start to get into advertising and, and your website, like there's this feedback and this information, the scorecard that can help you understand how is my marketing doing? And the same on the finance side of things. If we have some sort of financial data, it can start to give us feedback. It might not be fun to look at it at first, but once you're able to understand it and you're able to have the courage to look at it, that's when we can start to go, oh, the gas... Um, that the gas gauge is low. I need to go fill up on gas. Oh, the tire pressure gauge is on. I need to fill the tires and then we can keep this, this business well-maintained and it just cruises, but it's just getting that initial look at your, your numbers and, and feeling brave enough to, to, to see what's there. That's the part I think most entrepreneurs get a little stressed mm -hmm. out about. The word brave is so apt. You just threw that word in there. You know, I, I'm laughing because just like last week when we talked to um, Meredith, our virtual assistant agency owner, and I was feeling triggered. I'm feeling triggered again. <laughs> but I'm I'm the person, actually, I literally have an analogy where I bought a car where none of the indicators worked. And I, I, I uh, what did I do? I, I broke the head gasket by running it out of oil. So yeah, I literally <laughs> did that. Um, anyhow, but the bravery thing, it's like, we touched on this a second ago. I know my money mindset comes from my upbringing where money was always a stressful thing. We weren't poor, but it was always the main source of stress in the household. And so I don't want to look at it. I don't want to look at it. We were talking before we pressed record that my business coach, who I invested in because I want to grow my business, threw me for a loop last week when she started talking about my money. And I was like, no, I don't want to talk about this. No, I just want to talk about how to make posts on Instagram and get more clients. Like I didn't want to talk about, I don't talk about this why like it, that lack of bravery so let's say you're starting with a client a client signs on with your your organization and this client is a practicing health coach doesn't really matter how how far along in their business they are but they've been head in the sand about this for let's say a lifetime let's say a few decades <laughs> what were just you? hypothetically <laughs> yeah just <laughs> where because you, you're making it sound easy you're making us feel like you know step in and be bold and lean in and all this stuff but where do we, what would be a good place to start? Where do you start with people like me? Sure. So I think the first place, like the first thing you can do to start to build a financial foundation, I talk a lot about this stuff in a um, free workshop we have on our website. Um, but the first thing is separating your business and personal finances. I think it's really important to have accounts dedicated to your business and then accounts for your personal life. Um, because again, I was talking about this extra responsibility we take when we go into business for ourselves. Um, when you're working for someone else, all you have to do is worry about your personal budget. How much money do I get paid? What's my mortgage? What's my rent? What's my car payment? What's my insurance? All that stuff, groceries, restaurants. Do I have money left over to start saving it each month? And again, I know a lot of people live paycheck to paycheck, but someone who is looking at their personal budget is hopefully trying to put money away into savings. Mm -hmm. When you have a business, now you're in control of your paycheck. You're the one that's going to decide how much you get paid. And so the only way to have clarity around that for yourself, 
for your accountant, for your bookkeeper is to have a dedicated checking account for your business. Maybe you have a, a business credit card that you use to accumulate points, hopefully get some free trips or some cash back, stuff like that. We have a, you know, a dedicated PayPal account or merchant accounts. So that way, I think for, you know, like I said, your accountant and bookkeeper, they're only going through your business transactions. They're not trying to go through, you know, your groceries and your oil changes and all that stuff. But also for you as from a mindset standpoint, as a business owner going, all right, I have my personal life that I have to manage the money. And then I have my business entity or my, my business that I have to manage this money and getting clarity on both of those things is so much easier when they're separated. That's actually where my log gem was after I ch chatted with my business coach. She's like, you got to set up all these accounts. So she, she has uses this profit first model where there's like a bunch of different accounts mm -hmm. um, for your business and a separate credit card and a separate PayPal. And I was like, no, no, nope, I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, what is that? Right. <laughs> but, well, does it, does it feel like it's like more work and more effort than you want to have to deal with for that? To, like more attention than you have to give your money or you want to give your money? It does. It feels like more work, but I put that level of effort into other things. It really is this money mindset long gem, long gem. I will sit and build programs and not, you know, nutrition programs all day. I will do marketing strategy till I'm blue in the face. You want me to go open another credit card, which I can do in 10 seconds online. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. Well, to be fair, um, and, and not to go against your business coach, Profit first can be cumbersome. We're not huge fans of profit first. I've talked about it um, a number of times and I don't, and I don't want to speak poorly of it because I know profit first has helped some people. Profit first is better than just putting your head in the sand and doing nothing. And I think that's why profit first has resonated with so many American business owners, because it's at least you feel like you're doing something. In our opinion, it's a little more cumbersome to manage because I don't, we have one checking account. We don't have seven checking accounts. If we had seven checking accounts, my business partner who really acts as our CFO as well, he would kill me if I opened another six checking <laughs> accounts because it just adds complexity um, and, and, more, and more difficulty to the business. And then also the metrics that the system goes off of in terms of put this much money in this bank account or that bank account um, isn't necessarily the metrics that make sense for your business. It might be a good general starting place, but like for instance, with our clients, we have very specific metrics that we know for coaching businesses, course-based businesses, membership site-based businesses. We know like, when are you spending too much on ads? When are you spending too much money on team? When are you spending too much on your own continuing education or um, your software expenses or whatever it may be? Because we've seen over and over again, we know how healthy a business can be and how well it can run with a few expenses. And we've also seen our clients overload on expenses and spend too much money in certain areas that we know, like, this is roughly what we would want to be spending in each part of your business. And again, if you have someone giving you the proper reports, who's doing the bookkeeping for you and pointing out, Hey, as a heads up, pay attention to these two things. And really as a small business, as long as you're paying attention to your advertising costs and you're paying attention to your team costs, and none of those two things are blowing up, your business is likely going to be super profitable because because that's just kind of the nature of, of online businesses. So again, profit first can be great for some people, but for you, Aaron, like, especially you might just be like, I'm not going to look at all these bank accounts. This is crazy. And that's where maybe a bookkeeper could help um, bridge that gap a little more where they're doing more of the heavy lifting around the stuff you don't want to do, but they could start to hold your hand around showing you, all right, this is what your business is doing. This is what you just should start paying attention to. But it's like 30 minutes to an hour a month out of your entire workload. The rest of the time, focus on your marketing, focus on driving sales, focus on scaling your business because it's number one, it's the fun part. And number two, it's the most important thing you can be doing in your business. Hmm. I guess I didn't know that bookkeepers would offer that kind of coaching. Like, hey, mm -hmm. your, uh, your advertising's a little, a little up this month. Maybe keep an eye on that. I guess I didn't know that that was uh, something that you could ask or expect from a bookkeeper. Well, and that's, we do things a little differently at Evolve Finance. We really, again, I feel, I always feel bad kind of bad mouthing our entire industry, but I think a lot of bookkeepers and a lot of accountants um, don't get into this business to want to provide customer support and provide customer service. Uh, they want to get into their spreadsheets. They want to get into their so their tax and bookkeeping software, um, but they don't really want to provide a customer experience. There are some out there that do, and, and we know that there are um, people out there doing really great work for their, their clients. But 
for us, we felt like we wanted to bridge a gap because your, your bookkeeping isn't just about getting your taxes done. Right. It's obviously really important. We get your taxes filed, but every month you go in your business and aren't getting some sort of feedback on how did we do last month? Did we bring in enough money? Did we have profit left over? If we didn't have as much profit left over as we wanted, what was the issue? Did we not sell enough or do we have an expense that we need to take a look at? And it's usually very simple. It's usually very obvious, but if we don't have someone doing the books every month, and if we don't have someone who can kind of provide some guidance and give you a framework of what to look for, then Mm -hmm. Again, it's just never going to, it's never going to happen. So I, I, I know there are a few bookkeepers out who have that, that mentality, um, but it's definitely kind of rare. And, and I think that's why our business has been so successful at serving the, the niche we serve um, because we all want guidance around the parts of our business that maybe we're just not experts in, or we haven't been taught how to, how to manage right. yet. Well, and there's, I mean, you had mentioned QuickBooks earlier. There's a lot of functionality in a program like that that can break things into categories and, mm -hmm. and what have you. But but I think a lot of times when you're in the middle of, you're in your business and you might be looking at these numbers and you can see and you can see the bottom line and you can see how much money you're spending. But I, I think being able to work with somebody that can then talk things out with you and talk about the relative value of these expenses and kind of where revenue is coming from and be able to dig a little bit deeper is really helpful too. Cause you know, one thing that, you know, Hey, if we didn't produce the amount of revenue that we had, sometimes those expenses are necessary to grow. My answer is totally. cases too, with, um, many of our graduates is, are you charging enough? We got lots of people that are plenty busy, right. And they've got clients and they've got these expenses, but they, they are not charging enough money to be able to back into really what they should be making to make this endeavor financially, um, financially rewarding, but just financially sustainable so that you can yes. even be here to help other people. Yes. And that's the importance of understanding the basic financial structure of your business. Because, uh, if you have a business, if, if I told you I'm making a million dollars a year in revenue in my business, most people would go, wow, mm -hmm. that's really impressive. A million dollars a year. That's crazy. How do you sell that much? And I go, oh, I spend $800,000 a year on advertising. <laughs> and you go, oh, well, that doesn't sound like you're going to have enough money because aside from advertising, you still have team, you know, if you have a million dollar year business, you're probably going to have to pay for team members and lots of software. Like you might be just breaking even in your business. So does, is there some something to be proud of in the terms of like, you have an offer people want, people are buying it. Sure. But just there gets to be a point where I think in the early stages of your business, you're just like, I just want to sell something. I just want to convert people mm -hmm. because it's such a challenge to have to be the salesperson in your business or be the main marketer in your business that it's just exciting to get anyone to, to pull out their, their credit card or their debit card. But we have to get better than that as our business grows because it becomes, it, it no longer is going to be good enough to just make sales. It's going to be, are we charging enough? Are we managing our expenses well enough to make sure that the math in your, your business makes sense? And when I say math, I mean, adding and subtracting how much money came in, how much money came out. And if the math just isn't working because of the way you're pricing your business or the way you're marketing your business or the way you deliver on your offer, then you need to know that as soon as possible mm -hmm. so you can make the adjustments to make your business financially viable. And again, maybe this sounds confusing to, um, to some people, but the math is usually very simple and the numbers don't lie. And I think as entrepreneurs, we have to learn how to take this feedback, how to get the reality of our situation put in front of our eyes accept that situation so we can make changes because we have the power to actually make those changes and make those decisions so our businesses can work better for us versus if you're working for someone else and your boss is a jackass making horrible you know decisions for the business and you can't control that that sucks mm -hmm. but as business owners we can control that but we have to again be brave enough to look at the realities of our businesses so we can make better decisions so that we have some money in our pocket at the end of the day I've heard it say, uh, said that if you, you don't, if you don't have money in your pocket at the end of the day, then what you've really got on your hands is a really time consuming hobby. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
which, you know, I, I think about a good friend of mine who's in kind of in this entrepreneur small business space. And I'm thinking about this in the context of scaling, which is a question we get, we get asked a lot um, by brand new coaches who don't even have their business off the ground yet and just right. want to know how to scale. But that's, you know, a story for another day. But I think about this friend of mine who has this really cool, successful business model and decided to get into offering swag, branded swag. And because she thought it'd be cool for branding and cool for like, you know, the socials and the amount of money that she's putting into the swag when she would, when she looks at her books at the end of the year, she's making like a couple of grand. I'm talking $2,000 at the end of a year as she has in the bank because of the expense of the swag. And there's no margin on that, but it was a cool idea she had, but didn't, didn't think of it from the perspective of what it's going to look like in her wallet at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's a, maybe that's a, an unfortunate way to go about a passion project. Like a lot of us are doing this because it's a passion project, but at the same time, why scale to swag if it's not going to, you know, add up at the end move of the, the year? Ne- yeah. If it's not going to move the needle on your revenue. And that's, I mean, that's a perfect example because we regularly tell our clients don't, get physical merchandise. Why, what is that going to do? Even our clients with large audiences, I mean, how many shirts are you going to sell? How many coffee right. mugs are you going to sell? They sell nothing. But when they're offering their programs that are worth 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, $10,000, why aren't we spending more time just figuring out how to sell that? And I think, you know, I, I can't remember which one of you, which one of you said it, but I think there is this fear of success. There's this fear of pushing ourselves to do the things that will move the business forward, that we find ways to distract ourselves with stuff that feels comfortable mm-hmm. and feels fun, but isn't the real work that's going to move the business forward. Oh my gosh, a million percent. Like how many oh, yeah. times do you see a new coach stress about their logo before they go to business? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And that's, that's again, what I was just talking about this on another podcast yesterday, focus and priorities. That is the name of running a small business. There is, I mean, both my business partner and myself have fallen into this trap, just like all of our clients have. There's so many things that you want to do in your business. Like I have a laundry list of things I would love to work on for Evolve Finance. Um, Everything from writing a book to expanding a new revenue stream. Like there's all this stuff that would be really great, but there's, there's prior, there's priorities in our business that we've been able to, to recognize that if we stay focused on these priorities, our business is going to grow faster. Mm -hmm. We're going to be more profitable and the business will be more stable. Now, does that mean we won't get to some of these things on our checklist that we want to get to down the road? Absolutely. But as you have more money, you have more team members, you have more resources, you can start to expand into some of those things as you maximize because you're maximizing the opportunities that are already in front of you. And that's where your numbers, I've seen it over and over again, show our clients. It's like, why are you selling 12 things? Right. Like, what's your main offer? What's the main thing you're selling? Sell more of that. And we see our clients' businesses grow or you, they start to invest in all of these different marketing strategies. And it's like, why are you investing in these things when we haven't even maximized the one strategy that's bringing you the most clients right now? And they go, oh. And again, I think we've fallen prey to it ourselves. There's been certain steps in our businesses. I think we've been kind of scared to have to do um, at certain stages of Evolve Finance's development. And, and we eventually step into those and make it happen. And then we're like, oh, why did we wait so long to do this? Our business is now growing so much faster and we have mm-hmm. happier clients because of it. So these are the kinds of things that, again, I think people think, oh, it's the numbers are the math and the taxes and all that, but it's literally can help you get focused and prioritize the right things in your business. Because when you see the numbers, your business becomes so much more tangible and it's not just a feeling anymore. It's like, it feels mm-hmm. like it's going well, feels like I have money in the bank or don't have money in the bank or whatever it may be. We need to trust those instincts. We need to have some intuition, but we also need hard data and hard facts to balance out those feelings with so that we can you know, make decisions based in reality, not just based in feeling. So I would love some... <clears throat> advice here on, uh, cause I know we have a lot of people that listen to this podcast who are very brand new to this. And I, there's also people that are in various stages of their business where it kind of feels like it's like, a, it's, 
they're like almost like a do-over or they're moving into a new. So, and, and I'm an example of this. I moved from one state to another. Most of my practice, I just managed out of the gym. Like all the financials, everything was done because it was just much easier than having my personal finances, the gym staff and my health coaching staff. So I mm-hmm. kind of collapsed those two together. Well, I moved, I'm selling that gym. So I am literally starting everything over from scratch. There's a lot that I learned the second time around. So I feel confident <laughs> that it's going to be better to manage. But <clears throat> what I would love is to hear your thoughts on somebody either starting new or somebody starting over perhaps, or maybe entering into a different endeavor. They've accomplished what they want to accomplish and they're taking things. Where should people start as far as getting their financial house in order? Because everything will go a lot smoother if they get it in order from the beginning, rather than trying to fix a bunch of stuff down the road, when you actually do find some success and now you've got to backtrack. So we've already talked about a couple of them, right? Mm -hmm. Get your business and personal finances separated. Um, the one thing I want to emphasize here is when we separate your business and personal finances, I also think it's really important to get a personal budget together. Your personal budget becomes significantly more important to have when you're an entrepreneur. Um, because you know, for instance, we've had clients who maybe came from very high paying careers before, like maybe they were a lawyer or something like that. And they want to start an online business because they're burnt out, but they've also built up their personal lifestyle to the lifestyle of a lawyer making a lot of money. So they have to make a decision around, okay, I might have to make some sacrifices in my personal financial situation in order to allow my business to have enough cash flow. So they're not taking every dollar out of the business to pay themselves when that money would be super useful to help them grow the business. Doesn't Mm -hmm. mean they're still not getting paid, but their salary might be a little lower than their, their, previous career salary right. temporarily until the business grows. So I think that personal budget is really important along the way. Uh, we talked about it with Profit First. How can we keep our accounts simple? One checking account for the business, one credit card for the business, one main merchant account for the business. Um, we call it sales software, but how do we have one piece of software where our customers or clients are checking out through? They enter their credit card information through, let's not have four different places they're entering their credit card information through, right? Mm-hmm. Keeping that simple so you can log into one place and see how your, um, how your sales are going. And so if we have business and personal separated, we have our personal finances really locked down. We have just the, the few accounts we need to have. So money's not going through a bunch of different places in our business and then get an accountant. We're a bookkeeping firm. We don't file taxes. And I regularly, regularly will on these, you know, podcasts and webinars say hire an accountant before you hire a bookkeeper because your accountant, well, uh, depending on, you know, if you're in the U S or, or Canada or Europe, um, you know, every tax situation is a little different, but no one really has a super simple tax code. Like there's very few countries where it's like, it's just this percentage and that's it. There's all this complexity to it. And if there's a little bit of fear I can put into everybody here, it's that the, the, the nightmare situations that clients will come to us with is always I trusted the wrong person to file my taxes, or I tried to file my taxes myself, or I trusted someone who's not qualified to file my taxes, Mm -hmm. to do my taxes. And now I have a big fat tax bill and it's stressful and it sucks. So that's where getting an account, if you're committed to being a business owner, then let's assume every year we're going to have 500 to $1,500 to file your taxes. Mm -hmm. Even if you think it's pretty simple, just get an accountant involved in your business because they can help you understand if you should form a business entity. They can help you, you know, let you know if you're going to have to keep up with some quarterly tax payments. They're going to help you to understand what you can and can't write off through your business. So we're not just like, oh, my whole life is my business and I'm going to write it all off. And then again, you get audited because it looks super weird to the IRS. So those are kind of the pieces I would say it's just so important from the very beginning. Like let's separate the business and personal. Let's get your personal finance, you know, your, your, your household budget in order. Um, let's keep your financial structure of your business as simple as we can. And let's get an accountant involved. So you have someone to advise you with some of the more complicated aspects of being a business owner. I have a follow-up question and a, and a follow-up statement, a lot of what you just said. So follow-up question is when we're looking for this accountant, because your advice is get an accountant first, 
what what are the Google keywords that we're searching? A small business accountant, accountant for health coaches. Like, what do you think? Is is that an area of specialty in accounting that we should be looking for? There, there are accountants that um, might specialize a little bit more in digital businesses. Uh, we've run into like a couple of them kind of like kind of doing that, but a lot of accounts just kind of want to take whatever tax returns they can get from whatever businesses that come mm -hmm. their way. But I do think if you can work with someone that deals with small businesses a little more is, is, is a good place to start. Um, and I also think setting the expectation with, you know, of what your accountant is going to do, depending on your budget, um, because an accountant who's going to file your taxes for five to 700 bucks is going to be a little different than like the accountants our clients are paying for who might be two to $5,000 a year. And it's money well worth it when your business is big enough and sophisticated enough to have that level of expertise. Mm -hmm. if, if you're looking for account, the main thing you want to know is, do you file business taxes? And can they also file your personal taxes in the US that's typically gonna be two mm -hmm. separate things? And do they answer questions? Like if you have questions that come up, are they gonna charge you extra for that? So you know what the cost of that's gonna be. Um, if they give you a weird answer around like answering questions and supporting you, that might be a red flag because we regularly hear, well, my account, I email my accountant and it takes them a month to get back to me. And yeah. so you really wanna just see, well, how much are you willing to support and how much are you willing to ask, you know, answer questions as I, as I have that and have them and how is that built into your cost structure? And if, and if they understand the basics of your business, and I think for most health coaches, uh, that it shouldn't be too complicated for them to wrap their heads around. If you're doing more courses and group coaching and membership site stuff, they might not get it completely. Um, but especially in the early stages of your business, it should be simple enough. Your financial situation should be simple enough that they'll be able to handle the tax return side of it, even if they're not experts in, you know, the, the nutrition or health coaching world. One thing I wanted to follow up on that you mentioned, it, it, this is interesting to me because the question that Laura posed is like, if you're starting brand new, what are some of the things that you should be aware of? And one thing that you mentioned, like it, it's so, it's so wild to me how intertwined all this stuff is, because one thing you said is you should try to stick with one service, Stripe or Square, for example, mm -hmm. not both. But what's interesting is the tools that we build our programs on integrate with one or the other, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about building your program and what platform am I going to use to build my online course and what platform am I going to, e-commerce platform am I going to use to you know sell this thing? You have to understand which integrations they work with for I, I have square and stripe because of the tools i've brought into my business over the years some of them some of them integrate with square some of them don't some of them integrate mm -hmm. with Stripe. so it's like all of the moving parts of your business like we we really can't think of these things in a vacuum we really do have to zoom way out in a manner of speaking i also think that's probably a little intimidating for the new business owner too to think oh my gosh the you know, the email marketing service I use doesn't integrate with the, and my bookkeeper and my accountant are going to be annoyed that I have squares, <laughs> you know, like it's, it, there's a lot, I just, this is just a statement there. I don't know if we yeah. have a question to follow it, but it is very big picture. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and there are solutions um, for almost anything you want to do in your business online now, but this all comes back to, are we trying to offer too much? Are we trying to do too much in our business that we need to have all these different platforms and merchant accounts because it's like, oh, well, I need Shopify because I want to sell um, some swag or some nutritional stuff or oils or whatever. And I also need this other thing because I need, that's how I want to charge for my one-on-one -on -one coaching. But then I also have this course and I'm going to need another platform for that. And so for me, I'm like, well, how much money are you making from all those things? Mm -hmm. A little bit, a little bit everywhere. Pick one. Where do your customers want you the most? And simplify your operations because your operations and your finance, so, I mean, they're, you can't have one without the other. Right. If your operations are complicated, your business is going to be more expensive to run. It's almost guaranteed. If our operations is simple and streamlined, chances are you're going to be sitting with big piles of money in your bank account because your business is focused, it's refined, and it's clear who you serve how you're serving them, and you're pricing your offer appropriately for that. We have clients who have built multi-seven-figure businesses selling one offer. Yeah. And then when they get to that level, they go, oh, wow, like 
Maybe I need to have an upsell offer or a downsell offer so I can maximize these people who are getting in front of my business and getting in front of my offer because not everyone who gets in front of your offer is going to buy it. So how do we maybe have some complimentary offers? But when you start to have all these varying offers and everything's so different and mm -hmm. not connected with each other, then of course, you're never going to maximize your sales on any of those things. And your operations are just going to be way more complicated because you have to have all these these operational pieces to support all the things you're trying to sell. So that's why I literally just did a podcast episode. Uh, I recorded my episode yesterday. I just do like 15, 20 minutes on my podcast, just talking about these kinds of things and less is more. I did a mm -hmm. whole episode about how less is more because it's so counterintuitive. We think if we add things, that's what's going to be moving our business forward. And most of the time it's removing things that it's our, when we see our clients right. remove complexity, that's when revenue skyrockets and that's when their profit gets really juicy. That's great advice. I can't even tell you how much I love that because I, I just think people, the idea of getting started, it just seems so scary because it all seems so complicated that there's so much to do. And what I think that statement does is it gives people the freedom to start simply. Yes. Who are you? Who do you serve? What problem do you solve and how are you going to solve it? Now you've got this, how am I going to solve it? There's your product, your program, whatever it is. And you've got to run with that at full speed ahead, focused and simple. And then, that, and then I lo also loved what you said, like an upsell or a downsell. These are coordinated offers that are actually relevant to your main offer. They're not random, like, oh, a squirrel, wouldn't it be great if I offered, you know, this <laughs> cool thing. It's, it's no, totally. what can I offer that is actually, um, you know, it's related to my core competency. You know, um, I've got my flagship 100%. offer and this is what I've got. And for folks that, uh, so for example, you know, I'm leaving my gym behind and I'm such a gym rat and I miss it. And I know I'm going to miss that kind of training. So I'm going to be adding it my, rather than having just my health coaching program for remote clients that didn't include any of that, I want to be able to include it. But now I've got a couple of people that are asking me, well, can, can you just program for me? I just want the programming. I don't want, and I'm like, oh, okay. Maybe there's a service to be had for that, but it's not something totally separate. It's yeah. a service that I offer anyway. This is an, a, a quote unquote downsell opportunity where I'm just taking a piece of what I do and kind of carving it off. And, and I get, and the one caveat I would say to that, Laura, is that if you have the, or if you're in the early stages of your business, you might need to experiment with your offer a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Like you might need to test some things out. Um, but once you, and this is again, where I think it's a more of a mindset thing. Once you have something that people are like pretty pumped to buy it, it's easy to sell. People are jumping in. Uh, you're really good at it. Double down on it, triple mm -hmm. down on it, remove the other stuff. Now don't offer the other things. And what we, the reason we see that skyrocket for our clients is their marketing gets better because mm -hmm. if I go to your website, I'm so-and-so I do this. This is the problem I solve. Are you in or are you out? Like, obviously there's a little more nuance and sophistication right. <laughs> marketing there, but it's like, oh, you solve my problem and you understand what I'm trying to figure out here. Cool. I'm going to go deeper into this and see if I want to make a purchase with you. And so they're not, the, the audiences tend to not be confused by, well, you want me to buy this or do you want me to buy that? Or like what is, and again, we see that in our clients' numbers that when they do that, their revenue takes off. And then on the flip side of that, now if it's like, oh, I have this one main coaching package I sell. I can hire contractors to support me on that. I only have the software I need to support that main offer. And I don't need anything extra in my expenses or operations to do other little things that aren't moving the business forward. So now you're starting to build this like, um, this like factory line process where it's like, here's, here's the people I'm serving. Here's how I get them into my sales and marketing funnel. This is how I onboard them and get them through my program. And this is how we move them out of it. And it starts to be something that you can standardize, you can systematize and starts to become like a well-oiled machine. That's scary for some people because, um, that means we have to do some work to maybe do some of the not sexy th parts of our business, which is the next launch or promotion or the new social media thing. It means, oh, I have to build out a team or I have to do some of these other pieces to make this business more stable. But if you're willing to do that work, sky's the limit. Like it really is how big do you want to get? And the more mm -hmm. you're able to lean into those things that really work, 
even if it feels a little scary, I promise you, your checking account is going to look very different. You mentioned operations, which I, you know, is encompassed in what we're talking about here. And, um, you know, I, I went through an exercise recently where I was looking to take, bring on a sort of streamline some of my processes with a, with a new software program, a, a CRM kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the guy who I was working with, this account manager said, I need you to write down all the tools that you're currently using as they pertain, all your digital tools, as they pertain to your business and, you know, the, the customer sort of experience wow <laughs> I, <laughs> I am paying a lot of monthly fees for a lot of tools um the reason he asked me to do that is because you know he's trying to sell me on this program that you know does it all for one one thing which is great but that seven years i went without auditing that seven years in business without auditing the new tool I brought on. Oh, here's another new tool. Here's another new tool. And then I had to sit down and try to remember them all and go through my credit card and see how much, like, and this is how terrible it was. I had to go through my credit card statement for the first time in seven years and see how many monthly payments. <laughs> terrible. Um, do you recommend that business owners do this on like a, was that like a, like a half day, like operations focus once a week, once a month, like, do you have sort of any, any advice around how to structure your work week in terms of set aside this much time to pay attention to your books, set aside this much time to pay attention to your operations. Do you have any advice about that kind of stuff? I, what I would say is if you're just, if you're still figuring out what you're selling and how you want to sell it, get that figured out first. Once you start to have some success and make some sales, if you're paying attention, then the business will start to tell you where you need to focus on the bottlenecks uh, and you need to focus on where there can be some efficiencies. So that's where, again, if you're trying to figure out, oh, do I put you know my program on this piece of software, that piece of software, pick it. Just, mm -hmm. just pick the one that seems like it's the best one. Most like, you know, whether it's a course platform or your CRM or your email software, um, trust your gut in the early stages. It's not really going to matter. But once you start to generate more revenue, that's where we need to start carving out time to be strategic. I had, a, um, I worked for Adidas for um, almost five years and I, I had a mentor there and I, I got a chance to, to catch up with them right before COVID hit last year. And uh, we were sitting down and, and having, uh, having a bite to eat. And he was telling me, because he's managed huge teams. He, you know, he, he managed entire factories and operations teams. And he said, you know, there's going to be days where you're reacting to the business. You're reacting to the needs of the business. And you just feel mm -hmm. like you're answering emails and you're, and you're just supporting your team and doing what needs to get done in that day. There might be some fires to put out and there's some urgency. But he said he always carves out time to be strategic and to think about how are we operating, where are there projects and things we can improve on. And so he always carves that out. When it's slow, he carves out more time to be strategic. When it's busy and things are crazy, he might not be able to carve out as much time to do that. And I think that's where as business owners, again, you can sell a lot by just reacting and going and doing, but it, it, there does need to be this time, whether it's 20% or 30%, I don't know what the percentage would be, but there needs to be this time where you sit down and you go, okay, what are the numbers telling me? Or, Hey, let's take a look at like how we're onboarding our clients. Like, could we have a PDF? Like I keep hearing, it seems like there's just confusion when we onboard the client and this part comes up and they don't really understand that looking for ways to, how do we streamline the experience for our customers? How do we streamline it for our customer service people, our coaches, uh, you know, wh whoever's working on the business uh, and just really be thinking about um, are, are we doing everything the most efficient way we can? And are we doing everything we can to provide a really great experience for our customers and our clients? Mm -hmm. And finding that balance is going to be different for every business between efficiency and then experience for your clients. So, um, again, if you're just trying to make sales and figure out what you're selling, stick to that. If you know, Ooh, okay. This podcast episodes made me realize I have my main offer and I really need to just sell more of it then start to map out that journey for the customer. What are we, what are, what are the things that need to get done by a human? What are the things that are happening with our software and start to just question, is this the best way to do it? Does this make sense? Does it feel mm -hmm. like there's extra pieces that shouldn't be here? Does it feel like 
maybe there are some things that we can do that aren't going to cost us a lot of money, but it's going to really improve on the, um, the experience for the customer. These are the kinds of things that like, I don't have like a perfect answer for you, but I'm hoping that if you're paying attention to your business and you understand your customers and maybe you bring on like a, a business manager or an operations coordinator, or even just a really good VA, someone who can start to help you see those things and work with you through those things as well, you'll figure out what makes sense for your business. Cause again, it's not rocket science, but we have to be paying attention. We can't just focus on sales and marketing and expect everything else to fall into place. CEOs don't get to just focus on one thing. They have to make sure all the functions of their business is operating smoothly. And that's where um, I hope everyone can just trust that if you continue to educate yourself, you continue to challenge yourself, you continue to pay attention to what's going on in your business, that you will figure out what needs to happen. And if you reach a level where you're truly unsure of what to do next, because you're having so much success, there's probably a consultant or a coach out there that would love to support you through maybe that plateau you've reached and, and push you through that. So, um, thank you for that. Um, that there's a lot of inspiration in there for me anyway, but, um, so let's say we've got someone brand new, they are up and running, they've got their offer and they're bringing money in. Okay. And they're ready to roll. I, I'm just going to walk you through a, a common scenario selfishly about my experience. I'm sure Aaron can relate and a lot of other people. And now sure. you are, this business is making money for you. And now you're at a place where, and this is for many of our students, graduates, it's a part-time thing right now. They're, they still have their day job and they're trying to grow this. Um, and they're trying to make that financial decision, the decision to leap from that other job. Now, you know, one of the things I try to talk to people that are scared about, you know, you know, I, I can't just up and leave my job. Aaron, and I talk about, no, don't do, don't do that from day one. No, you've got to build a bridge. You've got to, you know, figure that out. And I, I got to imagine this is where some sort of coaching or perhaps bookkeeping support and helping you figure out financially where you are right now. And is it smart to make that move? Can you, can you speak to that a little bit about it? Is this something that your company does to help people with? Like they've got a business, it's up and running, it's profitable, but it can't grow because they spend X amount of time at this other position and now it's time to move. Yeah. Um, this is, what's your yeah, advice there? It's a great question. And it, there's not an easy answer here. Mm -hmm. um, with our clients, um, business, online businesses that come to us, they usually are making $100,000 a year in revenue or more because okay. um, the level of service we provide and what we do um, and, and, the, and the way we have to train our team, it's just that extra value becomes really valuable right. once you're making enough money to really get the most out of our service. If you're in that in-between phase and you're like, oh, I don't know if I should quit my job, it goes back to the personal budget, right? These mm -hmm. not fun things. If you know what your monthly nut is on your personal side, then you should be able to take a look at your side hustle, put some numbers together in a spreadsheet. How much money are we typically bringing in? Like you can literally do a spreadsheet and start to put all your, your income transactions in one tab that says income, start to total it up and maybe start to total it for each month. And then you can put another tab that just says expenses, go through your credit card or business checking account, put some of those transactions in there and go, how much is left over? And is what's left over enough to cover most of my salary, all my salary? Or you may be like, oh crap, I've just been scared of leaving, but I'm actually, I could actually live off of what my business is doing. And that's where we need that feedback and, and that data because everyone's going to be a little different. And maybe you're in a situation where the business, your, your side business isn't quite making enough, but maybe you're like, I know if I leave my job, I'm going to have the time to do this and I'm going to figure it out. I never advise that because you have to have enough self-confidence and trust in your abilities to go do that. But we've, you know, there are stories of people just going, if I don't put my full time into this business, it's not going to expand in the way that I want. The way we do that in a responsible way is looking at how much money do I have saved personally? Am I tightening up my expenses personally? This is where if we're making decisions without some sort of data or feedback, then it's always just going to be you guessing and successful entrepreneurs, successful investors. Um, they're not guessing. They're, they're making strategic decisions with information. And so the more we can start to make sure we have the information we need in our lives to make better decisions with our personal finances 
and our business finances, the less scary these things will be. And the more you can start to trust your gut a little more going, you know what, like the numbers are good enough or the situation makes sense to me now, I'm going to go do X, Y, or Z. And so that's where, again, it might not be the exact answer someone's wants to hear, which is just yes or no, but this is the way we have to start thinking critically and thinking strategically as business owners. Yeah. I mean, that, that's exactly what I was looking for because right before we started recording, I had, I had mentioned kind of my own exercise here. You know, I, I, and this is something we talked about in our last masterclass. I think you need to know your number. I think you need to know you like literally sit down and envision the life you want to live and, and really back into what, you need to bring in income, net income to be able to live that life. What is that number? And then compare that then to what this side business is providing for you right now. Where's the gap? And you can literally back into what this might look like. But the other question I asked myself and, and, and I did this with my husband was what do we really need? And you know, what are we spending money on right now? That really doesn't bring me joy. I have it because I've always had it. Do we really need it? You know, and I, what I really just took a look at what I was spending on clothes, that other job, I was I, thousands of dollars on new clothes every year because I was a professional. I needed new suits and new shoes and I'll could eliminate that right there. Do I need it? Do I need to go to Arizona every single year over Christmas right now? My family is six. That cost me another 5,000. I, I don't really need that. Right. So at mm -hmm. least for now, and then you kind of back into this other number and it's, now the leap is a little bit of a jump. It's not this tremendous like upheaval. You know, I'm a big advocate of mitigating risk, but you need to take some to get moving and only you can answer that question. Um, so thank you for that. And, and illustrating that, no, it's not that easy, but with the right information and not being afraid to really look at the numbers, I think it's just going to give you more confidence Well, let me, or, so or the ability I'll to plan. Well, maybe I'll leave you guys with this story and it'd be a, a good thing to kind of uh, end on here is when I was at, I was at Adidas and I was talking with my business partner, Corey, about, huh, I think I can help you grow this, this business. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I talked about it. We had a personal budget. We had money in the bank. I was going to take a significant pay cut yeah. working out of all finance, but after talking with Corey and realizing the opportunity there, there was business to be had. There were clients waiting to come on. I trusted my, the skills I had developed working in the sporting goods industry. I was managing a $50 million a year product category, golf footwear. So I'm like, if I can do that, I can get into this business and do this. I had been a musician and played in a band and I had learned how to hustle and market and promote. And I was like, I think I have the tools. I think we're in a good financial place where I can take some risk. And if I have to just go and get another job again, mm -hmm. then so be it. And my wife and I were aligned. My wife was supportive. She got it. She knew that it would be a good situation for me in my, in my career. So I did it. I took a huge pay cut. And within, you know, six months to a year, we got my salary up to a more better place. And then now I make significantly more money than I did working in the corporate world. And if I had stayed in the corporate world, I don't think I'd be making as much money as I am right. now. And I wouldn't be as happy and I'd be way more stressed out, even though I loved my time at Adidas. Mm -hmm. um, so even for me, someone who I felt like at times took risk because I was a musician and who the hell wants to be a musician and think they're going to make a living doing that. Um, but I, I, I kind of realized over the years, I'm willing to take calculated risks. If I feel like what's the worst case scenario, how do yes. I solve that? How do I get around that? And what's the upside? What does that look like? And is that motivating enough and exciting enough that I'm willing to deal with the worst case scenario in that situation. Mm -hmm. And if the worst case scenario is something that's going to put you in significant debt, is going to put important relationships in your life at risk, then maybe you got to rethink how you're going to make this move. But if you have the support of your family, you feel like financially it's not going to be completely irresponsible and you trust your skills and you have the self-confidence to know you can solve problems and you can figure things out. Yeah. You only live one life. Why, yeah. why wouldn't you? Gosh, and I think for most people, the worst case scenario is really just you go get another job in the meantime. Exactly. I mean, honestly, and that's the, it's so funny that you said that because 
I did this, I had the same exercise. This is all stuff that comes from the finance world, right? When we are trying to educate investors in making decisions, it's, well, what's the worst case scenario? And can we mitigate that first of all? And how likely is it really, um, you know, in, in moving forward? So I, I love that advice. So um, just for the benefit of our audience here, would you tell us a little bit about, so for what you do and what involve finance, how does somebody know that they're ready for a service like yours? to kind yes. of go to the next level. What, what should they be looking for in their own business for that? So if you're just getting started or your business is relatively small, um, what we usually recommend is doing a sort of spreadsheet bookkeeping. We don't recommend clients or you know people, entrepreneurs try to open up QuickBooks online accounts or zero accounts and do the bookkeeping in software. It's just, there's too much to know and there's too much bookkeeping expertise to do that mm -hmm. right. So if you're getting started, use a spreadsheet. If you're starting to use that spreadsheet and there's just too many transactions going on in your, your business every month that you're like, I don't want to open my bank statement and copy paste stuff over. This should be a nightmare. <laughs> then that's usually maybe start with a budget bookkeeper. You can get someone who maybe if your business is simple enough, and this is the benefit of keeping your, your business's financials simple and having your business and personal finances separate. If, if there's only a checking account and a credit card to deal with or something like that, then maybe someone can do that for a hundred bucks or 200 bucks. As you start, to, as you're really relying on your business for your full-time income, and, and usually that's when you're getting close to that $100,000 mark or beyond, that's when we would recommend people reach out to us because, um, like I said, you know, specializing in online businesses the way we do with coaches and course creators and influencers and membership site owners, we know how to do the books properly in a way a budget bookkeeper is just not going to. It's, it's mm -hmm. about quality. Um, and we do a really good job of supporting our clients and making sure they're, they can trust their numbers, which you can't always trust with bookkeepers that they're doing it right. But then, like I said, we also do, um, if you haven't picked up from this interview for everyone listening, we try to do a little more advising. We set up our bookkeeping service to be a little different where we have group calls where you can come and talk to me and pick my brain a little bit or ask for advice. Uh, we have a client learning center where we have course material that you can go through and start to educate yourself around your finances. And each one of our clients gets an account manager and a bookkeeper to support them with their bookkeeping every single month. So that way, if they have a question, they have an account manager who's actually going to respond in a reasonable mm -hmm. amount of time to make sure that there's something they don't understand about their numbers or they want something moved around that we're continuously just getting better and better at doing the books for your, for your business. So that's where, as long as you're operating us dollars, we don't, unfortunately we just can't support businesses out of the U United States. Uh, you're, you're selling digital products or digital services online. And again, you're getting to that hundred thousand mark or beyond that's when our service starts to make sense. Oh man. I'm bummed awesome. about the us dollar thing. Um, I was going to say, Aaron, based on your accent, I was thinking you might be a Canadian business owner. I am. I am. But I, I, what it's, I have to tell you, um, Parker, and I want to thank you because the energy that I feel about this now in our, in our conversation, it's, I have such a positive energy about money now. Like I want to go sit down and, and look at this stuff now. So I just want to thank you for, for making this feel comfortable and make it, making it feel important and inspiring instead of this fear head in the sand kind of thing. And if anybody is like me and, and had that same kind of awakening during this conversation, um, I think I just, on, the, on everyone's behalf, thank you for making this so gettable for us. That might be the best compliment I could, I could awesome. ever get in my field. So thank you. And I really appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Parkers. I'm just awesome. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate you having me on the show. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening. Well, if you've been listening at Health Coach Radio, you'll know that we're all about raising the voices of practicing health, fitness, and nutrition coaches, but most importantly, helping to further legitimize this exploding industry. Erin and I have disclosed often that we're on the faculty of the Primal Health Coach Institute, founded by none other than the health and wellness legend, Mark Sisson. And we've interviewed dozens of guests from just about every different health coaching program you can think of, and who practice in just about any conceivable way you can think of. But our allegiance is to the health coaching industry in its totality, first and foremost. 
It's our desire to continuously and unapologetically lift and promote this industry that nudged us to create this podcast for you in the first place. It's this same yearning that encouraged us to take the educational offering at our health coaching school to the next level. We are so proud to offer the Primal Health Coach Level 2 certification course, which when combined with our primary course, the Primal Health Coach certification course, not only satisfies the educational requirements to sit for the board exam, but is specifically designed to teach advanced coaching mastery. You will work closely with a small class of peers through this 12-week, very intensive, live online classroom experience to learn how to execute a coaching relationship that is truly transformational. You'll learn and practice how to ask powerful questions, what it means to hold space for your clients, but most importantly, how to actually do it. You'll learn about the craft of motivational interviewing and the nuances of habit change goal setting, and accountability, and how to nurture your client's own inner knowing, their intuition, and their own self-efficacy so that they will graduate from your care a truly transformed person. You want a big, successful, powerful coaching practice. And maybe you're devouring our episodes looking for the silver bullet that's going to launch your business into the upper echelons. We've said it a million times and we'll say it again, your coaching skills are what will make or break you and set you apart for success in this field. So if you're looking to level up your coaching skills and maybe dial up your credential and become a board eligible health coach, look no further. You can learn more about PHCI's level two program at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash level two. But if you would value talking to a real person about your path to being a masterful coach and perhaps a board certified coach, Book some time with me personally. You can access my calendar at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or just call me. You can reach me at 844-307-7662. Thank you for listening to Health Coach Radio, and I hope I get to talk to you soon.